public art of the University of Houston system. We are the oldest and um, only collecting institution in the University of Houston system. We are, um, our collections and programs span the entire system, so that's everywhere from Houston to Victoria, Texas, which is 130 miles away. Today, we're here to celebrate the unveiling of Folly, a beautiful site-specific work by Jorge Pardo. And Folly, just to give you a little context, is public art's third significant temporary public art project, as well as her second site-specific commission for Wilhelminas Grove. Our project, our program launched in, our temporary program launched in 2018, and um, these commissions, the intention for these commissions is to challenge artists to expand the scope and the range of their, um, of their work while providing space and support for them to enhance their public practice. As part of the Grove Commission, Folly was generously underwritten by the Brown Foundation, Inc and it will remain on view through the end of 2023. Let me then introduce you to Jorge. We are really excited and delighted that you are here with us tonight. He, he, Jorge was born in, in Havana and um, Cuba and emigrated to Chicago as a child along with his family. And while there, studied uh, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, but later trained as an artist at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. He has won many awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship Award in 2010, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, Lucilia Artist Award, and the Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award. His artwork explores the intersections of contemporary painting, sculpture, architecture, furniture design, um, and his work ranges from murals to home furnishings to collages to architecture, as you will see. And joining me to, to us today as well is Professor Jorge eh, Roberto Tejada, who is on the faculty at both uh, Creative Writing in class, the College of Liberal Arts, Arts and Sciences, as well as an art history faculty member here at the School of Art. Um, so thank you both for joining me. I wanted to, before, before starting, I wanted to just make a few announcements. We are, our intention is to have about 45 minutes of conversation followed by Q&A at the end. So when we do have um, opportunities to ask questions, please come to the front and ask them through the microphone. We're also going to be showing a QR code at the end of the presentation, which really helps us. Um, not only by, by getting your feedback, it also helps us plan future programs that, that you can enjoy. Uh, I also wanted to mention that Folly, the work, which is right outside, will remain open after the conversation for about 30 minutes. So please enjoy it. If you haven't had an opportunity to go, go and visit, uh, we'll, we'll have that, that opportunity after. And lastly, if you would like a behind the scenes experience at the work, please join me tomorrow for a lunchtime tour from 12 to 1. So with that, please, uh, everybody join me in welcoming Jorge to Houston. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Maria, and uh, thank you, Roberto, for uh, putting this together, and both of you, and uh, I look forward to doing it, speaking, and, uh, and thank you all for showing up. Okay. So, so let's begin. You said in the past that Robert Smith Smithson was um, was an inspiration for you, in as much as he suggested to you that you could build circuits outside of a formal gallery or museum system. And in his case, he found these circuits to be outdoors and um, and natural. And um, for you, you found your circuit in everyday objects. And I wondered if you could walk us through how you became aware of this, this alternate circuit for yourself, how you came to create objects that merge art and life. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was interested in Smithson because his, uh, his work didn't really require the kind of, uh, the, the kind of fragility that uh, putting things in a white gallery did. And they kind of just, they, they, uh, they kind of challenge this notion that that there's this other type of of work that can exist that can exist in the world, which is not necessarily it doesn't have to be traditionally monumental or 
it doesn't have to sort of, you know, it doesn't need plinths, it doesn't need, uh, you know, uh, institutional support, even though it really does, because a lot of his pieces are really managed after his death by institutions, but they're in places, they're in places that are kind of a, extraneous and far away, and they kind of, uh, they include natural flows of, of, uh, of water, <laughs> uh, you know, always with sort of issues of entropy and things like that. So I wanted to make works that I could sort of see if they could behave like that, but different. And I wanted to sort of understand how much of a, of a, a kind of a traditional context like I would need or not need or, you know, so I, it was, it was really interesting. And it's not just missions. It's all, you know, a lot of everyone involved in land art and also just, uh, any, you know, anybody in from that period that, uh, you know, uh, aspired to kind of construct a different kind of art object, a different kind of, you know, proposition as an artwork, you know, I don't know, I don't know. You're at a, dif at a disadvantage, but we have the advantage of seeing eccentric reflexivity, which is here from the Petzl Gallery behind us. And so you might talk about perhaps some of the ways in which you, you, you've mentioned inserting a problem in a space. And so, for example, there's a ladder or there's this refrigerator, and it seems to me that's an important part of your practice, problematizing a particular kind of place. Yeah, I, I mean, when this, a lot of these, these objects and... Uh, are from the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, they were they were kind of shown in uh, in LA in alternative spaces, for instance, in a way. So, like, uh, and uh, I worked with uh, with a gallerist uh, Butler who ran a, a space called 1301, and and he would do shows in his house, and uh, he's since become a gallery and. Uh, so um, you know, I, I, in, instead of bringing things to to his house, and and he, for him to show and display, I just started to use the things he had and started to do things to him. You know, like oh, that that was his refrigerator, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think one of the works was like, okay, I'm going to make a painting out of the doors in your refrigerator, and that's that's one of the works. And then I think I used his cabinets also and made like an addition. So it's not just about presenting or trying to find different modes of, of what becomes an exhibitionable object, but it's sort of doing it in a way where you describe, by the virtue of what you choose, it begins to describe where you are and where the work is. And, you know, it's like uh, these are domestic gestures in a domestic place. Well, the word that comes up often, and I think Maria was gesturing to this, is the idea of context, so that... I think through, through Smithson, you're interested in this division between inside and outside, or what can be out of place or out or of context. Or lack of division, right? Exactly. And it seems to me that that's sort of what's, what we're seeing in this transition from the Smithson spiral to the way in which you bring outside what might be considered something from the outside to the inside. In. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean for me, I was, I, was just, I was just trying to understand like, uh, and measure the effect of uh, these slight sort of differences and and how you might make like a reflexive product given the conditions that exist inside of an invitation and it's, it wasn't so much about inside or outside it was, it was more about like uh how can you make how can you shift something so that it, it kind of reorganizes the, the 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 components of the work so that maybe a different kind of um you know, uh, observational set of values have to kick in, or where it actually kind of speaks to to the conditions that are there. Like you know, like like I w in a way it was at that exhibition where the uh, where the refrigerator was. It was it was in a way in my head. I was thinking like, okay, I'm I'm uh, through these kind of like uh, kind of distantiations and kind of slight shifts and things. I'm really trying to portray. The specificity of the site. It's not really a site. I'm turning something that normally wouldn't be considered a site into a site by what happens to what you show, which is part of the site and how you show it. So maybe we could advance to the next slide. We're going to be doing a little bit of, of a kind of a survey of some of the early work to get to Folly. To yeah. And so I thought that we'd look at some of your early work in photography as a as a way of thinking through not necessarily your commitments to photography as a medium, but what it led to in terms of your thought. And I think some of this has to do with the way, and you can describe this owl. The pinhole camera, right? Exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, th this is a this is a an owl that's normally used to uh, keep uh, keep vermin out of your garden, other birds from eating your crops. They sell them at Home Depot and anywhere, really. It's a pretty it's a pretty ordinary object, and, and this owl was part of a project that I came up with, which is a photo project. When I was in school, the last year or so, I really focused on photography, mostly as a as a venture to try to understand what I what I thought about it, or how how to how to think it, or something like that. And uh, and so I sort of devised a project for myself where I would just uh, I, I couldn't figure out what to photograph because I had absolutely no interest in like taking pictures of people or or, or landscapes or and I kind of still I don't understand why photographs are in galleries to be honest. I mean, I kind of do, but it, but the, but you know, it's for me. I mean, the most the most beautiful place to consume that type of imagery is in books, or in, you know, like I really love, you know, when I when I would sit down with my mom and we'd look at our our pictures, and that 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 kind of intimacy is sort of like what photographs are really made for, and uh, which is not to say that there aren't artists who actually can do really good exhibitions and galleries with with photographs and things like that. But most, by and large, most of the stuff that you, that you see in galleries that are, they're just kind of blown up pictures that but are- you're, you're working in LA when the new topographics are really having a kind of, um, you know, Lewis Baltz, for example, yeah. you know, where, where the object is less important than the kind of the re repeat, repeatability and the verifiability of the, of the object, right? Yeah, and I wanted to, I wanted to kind of, uh, kind of short circuit what might be a photographic gesture and in that, short circus thing, I, it would spill out, its output would be this kind of problem of subjectivity of, of, you know, what's the object, what's the subject, what's being photographed, what isn't, what can be photographed, what can't be, all the kind of, you know, meat and potatoes of, uh, of, of like formal, you know, photographic, you know, uh, ways of inquiry. And then like you said as well also what's interesting is too how the camera which is a DIY camera also becomes kind of a vehicle yeah. and an art object itself. Yeah, the cameras are all kind of these these So simple. you might describe the pinhole camera just Yeah, the pinhole quick. camera imagine this owl is just a plastic owl and it's and it's and it's empty inside and all I would, all I did was just kind of cut its head off with a with a uh, a hacksaw, and then it, and then made sure there was no light in there, and I spray painted black in there, and then I, I, I basically put a piece of film, four by five film, in there, and uh, just held it up with a piece of tape or something. And this is all done in the dark. So imagine I'm I'm loading a camera, but my camera is a, a little eccentric, and uh, and then I would just tape the top of the head that I'd cut off with uh, black duct tape, you know, as best I could, so that no light would go in, and then. And then it, I just put a little pinhole through the plastic and just enough so that with a long exposure you would get an image. So we're looking at the image on the right as well, which has a particularity that you've described. <laughs> which one? Okay. Yeah, the, the image on the right. So these would get shown the way, the way you see it now. There would be, there would be the, the object, which is the camera, and then the, the picture that the camera took of itself. So I also, I also designated that the, these are not really taking pictures of anything other than themselves. But in order for that to happen, you have to put them in front of some reflective, reflecting object, like I did in front of buildings with glass. This one is in my kitchen, and uh, it just, it took the back, uh, the kind of blurry stuff on the back of the cabinets that I made that were just in the kitchen. But what's interesting about this, other than like that it's kind of perverse in terms of its, its limitations on how it can function as a, as a camera, is that, you know, the exposure was like, 10 or 15 minutes, and I was washing the dishes when that was happening, and there's no, there's no trace of that. And there was another one, it was a little cup, and then I put that in the men's room, but this is another camera altogether, and like I put it in, in the mirror on the ledge where you wash your hands, and behind were the urinals, and I don't know, like six people peed while, while this thing was, was working. But again, you don't get anything, so you know, you're kind of like, you're, but this is interesting because this is precisely all that invisible action, I think, is going to lead to the next kind of work which Maria is going to talk about, which is kind of architectural or at least spatial, yeah. right? There yeah. are stories or narratives that get left 
that are not seen in the in the photograph, but they're oh. an essential material to the to the image or to the practice. Yeah, I mean, I was think I this project was devised, I think, and it wasn't like oh, this is going to be it. It was it was just like oh, this is interesting. Let's see what happens when this, we do this. But one of the things that that I started realizing was that it's a it was like a test to 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 the degree with which a camera or a photographic device can actually like document, but at the same time, not document, which is kind of like, at the time, the, 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 uh, the most definitive way to look, to think photography always began with the, the, the moment, that the thing that was most critical, was, was most sort of uh, telling and the most descriptive and, and most true about photography is that it was there with you, or with, with a moment or a place, that there was no, that it, that it had an undeniable presence as as a, as the as, that was kind of almost surgically or naturally connected to the photo, and in this case, I showed you that that's not really that clear. So that's great. So Jorge, you um, started as a, as a visual artist, but from early on, and especially since from forty one sixty six Sea View Lane, um, many of your projects have been architectural and concerned with both showing instead of making the architecture but also interrogating domestic public space. And we wanted to show just a few of these projects. We're here um, looking at 4166 Seaview Lane, which you made for LA MOCA. Then um, also a number, the Reyes residence in Puerto Rico, Hacienda Teco in the Yucatan, and your most recent architectural or all immersive, inclusive um, architectural project, the, the hotel at um, Arles in France of 2018. Would you mind sharing a bit about how you made that kind of cross-disciplinary switch to work that is architectural? Well, I was living in LA in the, in the early 90s, late 80s, and uh, LA is, a, is kind of a, was a city that didn't really it was it was it was a it was kind of a culturally bleak city in terms of traditional culture, like you know, like our museums didn't really have the best Picassos or the, you know, like you couldn't really go and and see some really good examples of uh, of of uh, you know ni end of nineteenth century painting which I love and you know you would have to go to New York or you'd have to go to to uh, to Chicago or you'd have to go to Europe. But, you know, what we did have were reproductions and pretty much, you know, going to, going to school in California. One of the reasons people came out of California interesting, I think, is because of all, all the construction that, that, that you had to, the, all the, the armature mm -hmm. for teaching without, without the object just kind of called into question all these things that then become potential kind of directors for, for inquiries into form, which are eccentric. You know, like uh, if you think about education, and particularly art education, most the most historical places are schools that are connected to museums. And the reason for that is that historically you would you would go to the school. The art institute is one of them. Boston, the places in Europe, which I don't, you would you would paint in the museum in front of, of the in, object in, in front of the object. And it's like in, in California, we would we would be in a dark room looking at at photographs of everything and anything and uh, and and really and watching just as many films as we looked at work and uh, and after a while that process just becomes natural and you speak about art works of art as if you had seen them but you really haven't and you lose a sense of scale as well you don't know if they're monumental yeah, you have, or if they're tiny. you have no sense of scale you have a kind of a you know which is kind of nice because then you actually see this, the real thing and you go, oh, this is something totally different. So you're kind of, you're kind of making decisions about what an interesting motion, you know, in response to an artwork is that's based on, on something completely imaginary. And, uh, and I think one of the things that I thought of is like, well, you know, California, or Los Angeles at that time is kind of a it's, it's a, it's a, it's a desert compared to New York and in terms of actually like quality artworks. Um, but historically, uh, our, uh, Los Angeles has a, a really uh, important um, 
modernist, a collection of modernist buildings that were made from the teens on and, and you know, and, uh, you know, like Frank Lloyd Wright has a large presence there. There's, there's Schindler, there's Neutra, there's, Neutra. you know, Frank Gehry comes from there, who was primarily responding to these people, and you know Craig Elwood and different things, and, and they were they were kind of uh, they were contextually like like feral. Do you know what I mean? Like they were just kind of there. And I remember that's super interesting. These are kind of like these historical objects that are to me are just potentially important as a as a as, as a as a Richard Prince or as and they have no contextual control because they're just in the world. And I remember some of my friends would live, lived in these crazy places and they were disheveled and they were, but we knew enough to, to know that these things are kind of special because in them there's the seeds of, of like what the rest of the city actually looked like. <laughs> I mean, it's also a pretty heady moment in L.A. because it's when L Los Angeles is really being considered an architectural, u its uniqueness. Yeah. I'm thinking of someone like Rainer Bonham, who's teaching at UCLA and yeah. uh, thinking about the four ecologies of, of Los Angeles and, and, and giving prominence to things like Googie architecture, vernacular architecture, yeah. right, Hollywood architecture as, as legitimate ways of thinking about, sp about space or the built environment. And I think yeah. that's I think that's reflected in the way that you're thinking about space. Yeah, no, I, I, it was, and it was like you know, there's also uh, it was the origin of Sy of Syark, which was a place that that kind of you know um, taught architecture in a very different way, and and uh, there was all that that crazy experimental architecture, and you know, but yeah, there was, and I had friends in Syark. I mean, I I, I didn't study architecture, but uh, looking at, at houses in the same way that I looked at sculptures presented a a kind of a a very opportunistic way of, of problem making for making art. And how do you think this uh, architectural work, how do you think it's informed your more traditional studio practice? It's always been the same, you know, because it's sort of like uh, the, you know, I went to school in the, in the 83, 84, and we, and we finished, and I finished in like 88. And for instance, Art Center at the time had no, had no studios. And they had no 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 housing or anything, so you just went to class, but you had to kind of take care of your production facilities yourself. And uh, it was so. Then I started to think and like, okay, well, I'm very lazy, so I'm, uh, the best, the easiest way to make work is just look around, <laughs> you know. And then as I, the more I inquired, the more that I actually kind of thought, oh, that's interesting. I can. I can do this, I can do that, I can just, I'll just grab my ladder and, and what is the minimum requirement for, for me to do something to it so that it, it invokes enough reflexivity so that it becomes a work, you know? I mean, it's also, I'm thinking about this moment in Los Angeles, it also involves the sort of the ascendancy of at least five important art schools, Art Center, yeah. Cal Arts, UC San Diego, UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, there are others, and so there's a which are driven by kind of research-based or conceptual art. Mm -hmm. But I, you've 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 mentioned this in a couple of, of of previous occasions, and I think it's definitely clear in the work that your work is conceptually informed. But you're having a, an argument with with conceptual art, which I think you see as a kind of negative critique. And you're interested that is it's a kind of no. And you've talked about the yes or the or the yes joy. Yes is more. The, the yes right. is more. The excess. And to, to my mind, and I, you know, we've talked about this briefly, is that it, uh, it also reflects, I think, an interest in the Baroque, which comes out of a Latin American sense of, of space and its, own, its colonial histories, its, its uh, tolerance for paradox, violence, and, sensu and sensuality. And I think that's in your work as well. We're looking, by the way, at the Santo Domingo de Kooning and Barragan behind you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know... Um Coming from Cuba in the late '60s and the kind of living in in, uh, in in a communist country uh, and not being crazy like a lot of people in Miami, but and uh, you kind of you you you, uh, you 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 know a big part of like the progressive ingredients of these places that you you mentioned that thrived at the time was a kind of a a leftover you know. Uh, you know, like Frankfurt School, you know, landscape that these places formed themselves and became progressive with. 
And most of the kids that, that I was in school with were like, they were, they didn't even understand that like they were reading kind of, that they were involved in dialectical materialism and the texts that they were reading were kind of really in debt to, to a kind of a Marxist position. And, and it's different, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a Marxism that's, uh, that's utilitarian in a sense that it's not, it's that we weren't, we weren't, we weren't trying to make unions or <laughs> no, but there was a suspicion of the cultural in, culture industry. And yeah, and there was and there was a suspicion of the culture industry, which at the end of the day, it's like you know a lot of a lot of stupid kids going around calling themselves Marxists and things like that, and and you you, you would sort of like say like okay, well, you you don't really know what you're reading because at the end of the day, this is really these really that that methodology Marxist methodology is are, is a really good uh, analytical you know tool. You know, but you you didn't live in Cuba. <laughs> you didn't see like how fucked up it was, and how like at the end of the day that you know at least in the in the condition in Cuba, it's like it became totalitarianism, and it became like all the hopes and the dreams of everyone that started and uh, just going to shit, <laughs> and it and it got sort of just smashed up into this Cold War. You know, shit show. Well, definitely, some parts of postmodernity were interested in or celebrated austerity in a way that I think that you were responding to. That austerity has its limits as a as a kind of uh, point of view or perspective. Yeah, and then I formulated for myself that I thought that the reason there was this sort of attitude toward or this lack of re of reflecting on 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 the tools that you were sort of taught to, to think with was because Americans are by and large puritanical you know it's not there's there's no there's no real mechanism for 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 a, other other than a kind of a positive adoptivist strategy for these things because it's and uh, and i thought you know and conceptual art for me really ran on that same puritanical you know uh impulse there are there are exceptions there's people like lawrence wiener and there's but in general it's like the uh like the art that was coming out of California that was much more interesting, let's say in the in the in the eighties was much more interesting than to me the work that came out of the sixties because the work that came out of the sixties was much more like uh, the, the people it, it was more pseudoscience, you know. So there was there were directives in the work. There were they were like you know uh, like uh, you know somebody like like Sarah is is trying to like is trying to, to basically close down the gap between what's, what, the, what the material can represent and what the phenomenological reality of that material is. And I always thought, that's kind of that's conservative. Because that, those, those, those things are, you can never close those things. Like, I don't care how many, how many, how many you know, tons of, of metal you stack and, and perfectly align at the end of the day, it's like, it's gonna look like something. You know, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna always be susceptible to ornamentation of some sort, if somebody has the tools with which to, to play it out. You well, know, in this, in this conversation or or response that you're having to uh, a kind of austerity or to ornamentation, or when style, even minimalist style, becomes a kind of ornamentation, I'm, I think we can move to the next slide, which is uh, LACMA. It's kind of a jump, but you begin to think about the museum, and it's a kind of uh, institutional critique, but in, in a very, uh, I would say, um, uh, exuberant view of what can, how can we change the patterns of, dis of display, especially with regard to pre um, pre-Columbian works, so that they, they're re-enchanted in a way that they are less muse museumified as before. And so I think that that comes out in some of your, um, the design that you created for the LACMA. We're looking at LACMA's um, pre-Columbian collection. There were three rooms in, in LACMA. Maybe you could say a little bit. Yeah, about I mean, I think, I think to talk about LACMA, you have to speak a little bit about 4166 Seaview Lane, because Seaview, that project was the project that was up earlier. and. Uh, and that was a project where I was invited to do an exhibition at uh, MOCA in Los Angeles. And they said, Jorge, we like your work. We'd like you to do a show. And uh, it, there's a project space. It's not a very big space, but you're a young person. It's kind of a, a big deal. I mean, it's kind of my, my first or second museum show, like a proper solo show. But it was diminutive. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting. This thing is diminutive. I wonder if, I, and I, I said, I wonder if what, what scale, what, what this place can really, uh, 
contain in terms of scale. I thought, and then when, when Ann Goldstein asked me what I wanted to do, I said, I want to make a house. And it's like, but you don't want to use the space? No, I don't want to use the space. I want to make a house. It's like, what do you mean? Do you have a, a, a design for the house? I said, no, I don't. I just want to make a house. I want the show to be a, 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 a domestic place, like the domestic places that um, historically thrive in L.A., but made by somebody who has no authority as, a, as, a, as, a, as an author of these types of spaces. And, in the, and what I want to do is I want to use the, the, the time of, of, of preparing for this exhibition to turn myself into somebody who can function and operate and uh, almost put on like the costume of an architect and see what that's like. So, you know, and, uh, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna try to like make a problem for the museum, not talking about power or like in the traditional way, but, but I wanted the, the, the kind of eccentricities of the inquiry of the limits of, of what of what's, how to show something or what's acceptable as something showing to come from the phenomenological experience of the, the work. So it took a while and then I, uh, I bought a property and then I started making the house. They gave me some money for the show, but the house costs a lot more. And then things started to happen and like, you know, people, everyone was very happy that I had gotten away with getting a free house from the museum, but I really didn't because most of the house, I, most of the house was, I paid for most of it myself. But it was interesting because there was there were di there were there were discourses that were appearing in relation to this work with this work about this work that I couldn't control, and in that point I, I like I'm I'm very happy because I'm actually reading the work's output, and that's something I'm very interested in, and I think to go back to the uh, the pre-Columbian room, the pre-Columbian room, I was I, I kind of took like a sliver of, of, of that problem and, and kind of reapplied it, but using the objects as the guide to, to how to how to actually design a way of seeing them that you could never I could never get out of the way of it. And what I did is I I, I said, you know, everyone at the every professional at this museum speaks about these works in uh, in this in a very sort of quiet and ethical and and polite suspended sense of belief or you know suspends their disbelief because when an archaeologist talks about objects they will never it will never be affirmative it will always be with a sense of doubt this vase may have been used for this type of ceremony this object may have been, we believe. Never definitive, because we don't we, know. Or it's things like, we believe that, you know, this is like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So that's, this is a, these objects are all, they all live inside a, a kind of a, a very particular type of doubt, you know? And it's, and uh, I thought, you know, what I'm going to do with that space is I'm just going to, treat them like like a uh, like like the like I'm going to pretend to work on the display as if I was the person making the object not the person who was giving it function so I just literally looked at them and, and I, I, I took into account what materials they had what colors they had what shapes they had what forms they had and, I, and from that I devised a kind of an exhibition system that um, would work almost in a more painterly way like for instance, you know, the, the, there's different colors in the in the in the cases and stuff like that. And you're moving the viewer in a, in a particular way through the space as well, through these kind of curves and or um, yeah, and biomorphic I, forms. I'm making this bi it's a biomorphic sort of circuit. Yeah. And uh, as, and the, as the objects change, the colors change, and 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 uh, and, uh, and actually, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's a, every part of the exhibition is, is has a has a different geometry, and you know, it took forever for us to to, to do this, and uh, and then you have like these, it's almost like a, it's almost like I'm taking the aesthetic of, of these objects, and I'm and I and I'm running with it, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to sort of use techniques that that you would find in in a painting or something like 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 compositionally, or if something's green, I'm going to make the background red, you know, issues, like underpainting issues and things like that, but that deploy themselves in a very eccentric way. Yeah. 
But um, and just briefly, as before we move, this is also an interesting historic moment. It's 2008, and LACMA is hosting another important exhibition of Latinx artists called Phantom Sightings, curated by Rita Gonzalez, Chan Noriega, and Howard Fox. So these, I believe that this was in conversation with this kind of new attention to. The, I think it was. The, I think it, I think it was a uh, curatorially speaking, it was it, it made sense to have these yeah, two things yeah. at exactly. the same time. Yeah. 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 Yeah, these, these objects are receiving authority through through your work as well, granting or, you the authority. Or, I thought it was kind of weird that they would let me do this because I didn't. I know nothing about these objects other than like the colors they have on them, <laughs> the, <laughs> and their shapes and the materials and stuff. But I'm not an expert. I don't. You know, I, I can't look at a, a little funny little thing and 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 know what what it's uh, you know what it's historical quasi uh, you know religious function was <laughs> or, or whether it was a quotidian function. You know. All those things that are obvious to people that are archaeologists, you know. But they they don't know. At the end of the day, they don't know. Well, that was that was that was sort of my point in terms of like that kind of gave me license to just to just uh, you know do whatever the hell I wanted, and 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 I also think what I wanted to do is I wanted people to be to stay there longer than they would have if we had just used the traditional kind of European vitrine label, mm -hmm. you know. Dynamic, which is how you normally show these things. You kind of put them in a, in kind of what looks like a wealthy person's vitrine, and you you set up a circuit, and you look at the object, and you read the label, and then you go to the next one. You look at the object, and you read the label, and there's like a little thing, and maybe there's there's some supporting other objects, and so. So that that kind of reminds me a little bit about folly because you're doing essentially with these objects, you were doing away with a structure or traditional structure for the presentation of these objects, and. Um, when, when you and I first started to talk about the possibility of creating a folly here at the University of Houston, you, um, you mentioned that you wanted to work on a painting that was also a place, right? Did this initial concept change or evolve as we were discussing the work and de developing the, the structure and the work? stayed the same it just it just turned into what it was and, and I was thinking about that idea because of the because of the uh, the Rothko Chapel mm -hmm. the Rothko Chapel is you another, saw this morning yeah. yeah that I saw this morning it was, it was another it was just an example of uh, of an image that is a place mm -hmm. and uh, I thought well you know that's been done that way How, what's what are some other possibilities for for doing it and uh, but yeah the building is made for the, the pictures and and the lamps it's not kind of the other way around. I mean, it's like, uh, it's a little bit different. I mean, if you look at the, the Rothko Chapel, which I saw this morning, which was really interesting, it's like, uh, what is most interesting to me about it was how uh, reserved the exterior of the building is. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bunker. It's you a might bunker. enjoy a, uh, an anecdote. I went into the uh, folly just before this afternoon, and I struck up a conversation with a student who turns out is an architectural student, and he made the remark that about scale, that it seemed much smaller from the outside, and then when you entered the space, it actually went very capacious and kind of expansive. Yeah, I think that happens because of a uh, certain with the configuration of the space and also like the it's t the ceilings in the at the in the uh, of this of the interior are like almost they're five meters, so they're like sixteen feet high. Mm -hmm. But you don't really you don't register that height from the when, outside, from the outside mm -hmm. in, because your relationship to scale is in the trees and in the other buildings that are much bigger than mm -hmm. it and things like that. And then, but once you go in, you you kind of think, oh, this is kind of a g very generous little space. I wonder how that happened or something like that. So. It's something that's considered, but you know, I think it's, and I think it was, it was, you know, you asked me about that you were going to ask me about theatricality and things like that, and uh, that's one of the things that, that that I try to take into account, like what happens when. when well, you, maybe you could say a little bit about that because I do, in part because of our conversation yesterday about cinema, but I began to think that really your material, in part, is the viewer. The viewer occupies a space or activates it in a particular way, and that then becomes part of what completes the work, and it's, it's invisible to anybody except the, 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 those who experience it, but it, it's essential, it seems to, to me, to be part of the work. Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what, what, what allows, the structure that allows that to happen is that uh, the, the, the building has, uh, is, is, is lost in its, in its, uh, you know, in its program. 
in the sense that it doesn't quite, it's, it's not really clear what it will be. So, I mean, you need that. You need to have a building that, 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 that whose, whose program is not people oriented, but mm -hmm. like it's at the, the program of the building is at the service of some, 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 some trust that you have that these paintings are going to be worth looking at right. once they become part of this ingredient of, 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 of effects and phenomena and things like that. But it's not, uh, it's to house them, but at the same time to make them the place that's how, and it's sort of about trying to, again, trying to like, it's, it's a little bit like the way I think about the cameras and things like that where there's it kind of closes the circle, or it, yeah. it's, it's, it sort of seems to be a kind of homology, right? Yeah, and like for instance, for me also, it was very important that the, the the way the windows work, because the windows are are at every corner, and every turn, and every junction. And the reason I wanted that is because I wanted to to literalize and and make it almost involuntary that you're inside of an outdoor sculpture, mm -hmm. and there's nothing more. There's no more literal way to do that than having to having to kind of look at the sculpture garden as you walk through it or getting a glimpse of it which goes back to the to uh why i thought the the rothko chapel was so interesting because the rothko chapel takes a totally different tack on that you know it basically it it wants to be uh it, it wants you to leave the world behind when you go in and ascend maybe and now now it's made possible through the skylight as right. well it's an upward where this and the skylight is very sort of you know uh it's a very mediated type of light. I mean, it was kind of funny because it was just kind of, there's a, we went at the, at the time of the day and there was like a shadow right above one of the paintings and it almost looked like an object. And I thought, oh, why'd they do that? And then we looked and it was a shadow and it was like, because of all the measures that are taken to, uh, to like decontextualize that, that event of the, that space for those images and, and, and basically try to suck all these kind of like you know uh cliched notions of uh of theatricality out it, it, it what you know what really happens is it becomes more theatrical <laughs> you know? we'll have time for questions from yes the i was going to suggest that we open it up for questions from the audience as you're thinking as the audience is thinking and, com and coming forward i wonder if you've now that you've seen it here if you have any ideas of how you might like to see the space activated we're at a university, you've seen all, all kinds of, of the, our student body and, and this, where it's located. We've even seen this morning an impromptu flamenco dancer went inside and danced inside of the sculpture. I mean, the more the better, you know, it's like, I think that it's a place that's it's got a door on one, on one side and a door off the side and it's, it's like the same floor that you enter outside, you go out. So, I mean, the best you can hope for is that a lot of different differences track through that <laughs> and different kinds of events or, or there's, there's enough interest in it where there's some, some sort of, you know, human traces left in there and it keeps kind of, yeah, I mean, I don't, um, again, I don't, I don't know how to answer that without, without it, without being programmatic about what I would want in there. And in all honesty, I, I'm not. I want, to, I want to see how this thing behaves. Well, in a way, we talked about this yesterday, which is this, the difference between what might be considered a work, which is complete, finished, and that which is a, a text that is right. open-ended and, and is left, uh, its meanings are still to be defined. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I would use work, <laughs> that it's actually something that's living. Do you want to talk briefly about Oliver, Oliver, Oliver? Yeah, if we have a, I mean, I know that this was a, a work that I wasn't familiar with until yesterday, and so we, we brought, we have an image of it as well. You're interested in the cinema, it's the cinema at Braunschweig Parkours in Germany. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically, it's a, I was invited to, uh, to participate in an outdoor sculpture show that takes place in a park. And this was one of the first pavilion type pavilion -like structures. Pavilion-like structures that right? you, yeah, I mean, well, it was after it was after the pier and stuff. But um, I thought, I mean, I kind of, um, I wanted to make. I was looking at art a lot, and my displeasure with it a bit, in that I kind of feel like 
the, 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 the involuntary event of the viewer of actually making that work operate or actually be is not, no one really talks about it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's just assumed that when you walk into a museum or, or an exhibition that, that there is this natural relationship between you just sit on, on the box in the dark room and you look and you listen and you, you hope something interesting happens or something is revealed or something like that. But I, what, I'm, what, what happens when I go into these places, the first thing I say, why am I here? Like, what is it about me being here that is so important for this work's being? <laughs> you know, because I'm kind of central to it, its dissemination. And it seems like all those, all the cues, or most of the cues are arbitrary. Since it's like a black box, it's the opposite of a white, of a white cube. It's like, you know, generally the, the places you sit are covered in, in, in carpet, the same carpet that's on the ground. You're sort of like, you're, there's a projection you don't want to, you kind of, you don't walk in front of, you know, all these things that are, and I, and I thought, you know, um, I would like to think about, like, the, I would use, I want to use the opportunity of a sculpture park and its tradition of, of placing uh, sculptures, monuments, objects, celebratory ones, private celebratory objects, you know, uh, public, you know, governmental, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the, the war that, that people, that artists had in the 60s with the, with the plinth in the park has everything to do with the fact that most monuments are about death, mm -hmm. you know. They're basically, you're looking at a, at a guy on a horse who was killed or killed many people <laughs> and saved, saved your ass, supposedly. So, um, and I wanted, I was like, you know, that, that's kind of an interesting, dirty, dirty and difficult and complicated uh, tradition that I want to look at. And, 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 and when I say these things, it's just all inside my head. You know, this is something that uses to think the work into its being, that then hopefully if I've done my job right, gets material in some way and uh, and uh, I thought you know what is uh, what is most interesting about people's willingness to look at a moving image is how naturalized it's become and how it's involuntary and I, th and I thought I want to make a building where you can uh, you can watch people do this as if they were recess monkeys you know, like in the sense that you that you show free films that people like, you make the building transparent, and the 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 flowerer who goes in the park and looks <laughs> and walks around and thinks about the world and comes across this thing will actually look, have he can look at humans doing things that that I thought were extremely monumental, which is like this historical shift from us being people that looked at pictures. To, uh, to look, to went to moving pictures, and you know, everything in the way we communicate changed dramatically, you know, and it's, uh, and you know, we're, we're living it now. There's You've changed one of the, the true desires of, of the cinema, which is to be in a dark space where you're not being seen. Here you're right. in a space where you're being Inverse. seen. Right. So there's a little perversity in your, in your gesture as well. And the, the, that's sort of why the, I put the colors of it, because it's sort of like, it's like, it's like, it's like looking at the or, somebody's organs or something like that. So it's just sort of inside out. So that's great. Yeah, you don't have privacy. But you feel like you do, because you're in the film. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. So we have one question from the audience, maybe another? Yeah, definitely two questions. Hi, Jorge. Thank Hello. you for your talk. And I, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about the creative process of your, uh, of your work, Folly, and um, whether you've used some digital means. It's a large-scale project, installation, right? Do you use models, physical models, digital means? Do you, you, I understand you've probably worked with um, other team members who have contributed to the structure and what part of the of, of that interaction you would like to share with us? How you work with the let's say the the the, the people that design the actual structure? 
And then since it's a public installation and it was site-specific or it is site-specific, how do you incorporate that into your work and most importantly, the audience, you know, the, the public aspect of it. How do you incorporate the audience and whether you did some research about your, your communities around here and now seeing the final product, how does that meet your prior expectation, right? You did not see this final product until maybe a couple of days ago. So. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, it was Thank yesterday. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of a long question, actually. Process. <laughs> Right? Process. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've been working with, with robotic uh, machine cutting, you know, CNC machines for a while. I think I bought my first CNC machine in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And uh, I, uh, I always just saw them as a, as, as, as a tool. I never thought they were very. Uh, interesting as, as phenomena themselves. I mean, I think you, anything that, that has the word robot or robotic or digital or things like that is, uh, always lends itself to some spectacle of, of the future or something like that, which is kind of cool, but it's not really true because these things have been around for a while. The reason I was able to get those machines at that time is because the like, computation got, re got cheap enough which is always the most expensive part of those robots, like the processing, it's processing power so it can do its job. The machine itself is it's just made out of metal. And the, but it got cheap enough in the, in the late 90s that I could have a machine in my studio that, that 10 years before would cost close to a million dollars and I could buy it for about 100. And now you could probably buy them for like half again. And uh, so, I have a team of people that are at the studio. There, there's usually about anywhere between ten and twenty people, depending on how many projects we have. And uh, I lead them. I uh, I or orchestrate them. I I, uh, I initiate. I, I work with them. Um, I work I work on 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 a CAD program. I I use CAD, uh, which is. A little bit unorthodox for somebody my age. Most 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 architects that I know my age can do it, but not necessarily. They, but you know, I work with it in a very primitive way, and, and I sort of initiate ideas. I, I I draw things, and then it goes to a uh, through a process, different iterations, and until it gets displayed. So like you know, I'll start with sketches, and then these sketches are in three D. They're in three D. They're in they're in. Uh, Form Z, which is an old as hell software that I, I learned in the 90s that I still use. Everybody complains because now everybody uses Rhino and different things and SketchUp and whatnot. And uh, you start and then we sit down and I explain what I want to do. I have a person who's in charge of carpentry. I have a person who's in charge of, of uh, design. I have a person who's in charge of finishing, painter. I have a person who's in charge of the, the lasers. I have another person who's in charge of the, uh, the, the, the CNC machines. And we all get together, and I will program a way of doing what I want to do. Um, sometimes it's, 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 it, there are similarities in projects that we've done before. Sometimes we have come up with new ways to do it. But generally speaking, I'm kind of the person who, who designs the, the fabrication methodology for everything. You know, like every, you know, like, um, I used to make everything myself. So, and, and people, you know, the studios, I mean, I've had a studio now for almost 25 years or 30 years. So it's like people come and go. So you have to be able to train people as, as they move through. And since this is not really an idea place completely, it's a place of production. In other words, things, all these things that I speak about, that I think about are, are then, realized for real in in a, in a in an artist studio in an atelier with people helping and blah, blah, blah. and i have i have architects that work for me i have uh, computer scientists who then you know do funny things everybody who works for me starts in one thing and ends up doing something else and uh and i think what we do is 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 collaborative but i never lose sight of the fact that it's my work you know, and uh, and I think that's I'm okay with that because I think at the end of the day, my my role is really like a like a like a director in a film or 
you know, and uh, and I, I I'm very involved. I'm very involved in how the thing is going to be put together. How many bolts does it need? What color does it need to be? How to pick those colors? Like even if I don't pick them, I I have a strategy for people picking them. I kind of bracket, you know, things like that. So it's it's a lot. Of, it's interesting. The production, the, the fabrication of it is very interesting because it's complicated. You know, like uh, for instance, uh, this this project, the, the shell was made in Italy. The, the guts of it was made were made in Mexico. The lamps were made in Mexico. The the actual installation was done here. Um, so it's, you know, you have four entities mm -hmm. into an object that's all got to like fit together and, and not become a nightmare. And they kind of all fit. So it's, it wasn't bad. And how was it to see it together for the first time? Which was, oh, it was the great. part of your question. It was great. It was great. I mean, I, I, I uh, you know, there's always these kind of funny. Whoops. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you always, it's nice, you know, I mean, one of the, uh, one of the most significant things and interesting things that, that whenever I see a work that, 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 that kind of is realized is that, like, the, you actually, like, what it is and how big it is at scale and how all that stuff becomes palpable. And that's kind of the most interesting thing in a way. Yeah. There was one other question? One other question, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Um, so I have seen, okay, sorry. Um, so I've seen, um, you've used the word biomorphic and also I've seen that that's been used like in relation to your light fixtures and stuff. And um, I've also seen them compared to jellyfish. And I'm curious, like I know that you work very organically and are designing things just kind of intuitively, but are there, things in your mind when you're creating these specific light fixtures how do you see them like personally and what are some you know what are some interpretations of them that you can share um i don't really interpret them i try to come up with them um by looking at things that are doing interesting things and mimicking it and then adding more to that so that it 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 sort of distorts itself into another place, and and we were talking about the Baroque, and the Baroque per se is always interesting, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm representing the Baroque, but as a as a as a way of making something, I think it's important because it's a it's a like I think about the ornamentation of these things. I think about like, is there enough um, movement in difference events in the object so that it takes you 30 seconds as, as opposed to two seconds or, or half an hour like how is are the events of the object that are, that's the lamp or do they do they have enough stuff go, does it have stuff enough going on that there's going to be a big difference between what it's like when they're on during the day versus the, what they do when they're on at night where the primary structural sort of things that come out of this particular type of lamp is uh is much more pronounced um, how how's the sun? I mean, what is the, how's the sun going to hit them and kind of shut them down? You know, all, things like I think about things like that. And I, I, mean, I understood the question as well, and I definitely experienced it when Maria and I went in, which is that, especially in the paintings, there's a, a kind of all over patterning of the of the works that resembles camouflage. But I think the question is also to what degree do you have particular elements in mind that get kind of buried within the various um, layers and surfaces that you're thinking about? Um, I, when, I, when I'm making these things in the computer, I'm, I start with something sometimes very concrete, like maybe it's, maybe it's a picture of somebody, or maybe it's a, there's a, phone, a photograph on my phone that, I, that oh, that's interesting. I don't think about it as like representing that, but, I thought, this but it's is, material. But it's material. And it's yeah. like, okay, this is interesting to me right now on my phone. Let's let's put it on the on the screen. And then a whole series of things happen to to that with that. And then then it becomes then I kind of enter the space of, of a painter in a way, which is like composition and mm -hmm. and how do you move from this side of the image to that side of the image? What is it gonna be like? When the sun hits that, or you know, and then and then I try to I try to speculate about those things, and then I bring in other paintings 
that I know have uh, have certain resolutions that in them, and in that way, and what I mean by that is like. I, I like to use paintings that, whether they're, they're famous paintings of well-known people or not, that have resolved areas. So I don't have to resolve those areas. And I'll just stick it in there. And it's like, and then I'll, but then it'll get covered again. And then this area becomes efficient, then I'll find another painting and do that. And it, and it happens over and over and over. And after a while, it, it turns into, you know, like mush. But I'm always, I'm always thinking about, I'm, 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 I'm always saying, like, I'm a painter, too. <laughs> so there's always adjustments. It's not, you know, like, uh, this, these images, they don't, they don't, uh, they, they, they don't depend, they're not, they're not at the, they're not at the, at the service of the references in them. You know what I mean? But... Nor do they exist as an ideal prior to the making of the work. No, and I think what I've tried to do is I've tried to make a, design a process of making these images for myself where I can get lost. In the same way that I used to enjoy getting lost when I would make paintings, like big abstract paintings, and I love work from, from American abstraction and things like that, and this is something that begins and ends. And, and I thought, how can I kind of devise a way to feel like that, but I have no brush, I have no oil paint, and I have no canvas. I have, I have a computer. <laughs> so, what about the light fixtures? You mentioned that they also come out of interesting things that you notice. So, what kind of in interesting things? Uh, just the way light shimmers off of materials, or how they, you know, like uh, I thought, you know, it'd be nice. Like I'll look at flowers, and I think like that's an interesting flower. And so then we'll, we'll model it and then change it. And then but you're interested in forms within forms within forms because if you look deeply, there's all yeah. kinds of uh, semi-geometrical, semi-organic forms within the, yeah. the interior. Yeah. Again, it's kind of these, it's almost as if they're these, these um, a mise -en -a, like a mise -en -a beam of these mm. mirrored uh, reflections yeah. of, an, of some core that we'll never get to. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there's... I mean, if, if if we sort of move back a little bit, there's there's a, there's a kind of an inherent reflexivity in in the way these things are organized into their being. You know what I mean? It's never like a, I think like a product designer is taught to kind of kind of have an idea and then execute that idea and then refine that idea. Um, I I'm somebody who constructs a way to start and lose themselves in the next move and in the next move and in the next move and in the next move. And what's interesting about working on, you know, digitally on the computer and things like that is that um, software um, is, is self-archiving. So like, you know, by the time the Photoshop file and the Illustrator file has 20 iterations of the manipulation of the, of, of the image that, that may or may not be present in what you're looking at, depending on how they land and things like that. So, um, yeah. I like for people to get lost in the work, not necessarily, you know, I don't want them to find something. Like, I don't, I think yesterday I was thinking about young people and, I, and they would ask me, like, what is, what is it, uh, what are you trying to get, or this or that, and it's like, and I said, you know, the work doesn't have a password. It does. It's not. It's. You know what I mean. It's like to, to approach it that way. You're not going to get much of it. Much of it because the person who made it doesn't know. So. Do we? I think we have one. One last question. Um. So can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um. Hey, I just want to start by saying that I just recently learned about you. Uh, I really like your work. It's very alive, very colorful, very, I guess you can say, vibing. <laughs> um, so my question is, as an artist, um, have you ever worked on something and midway just give up? Since we, the viewer, see the finished product, have you ever struggled and decided to start all over again from from the start? You know, all the time. Yeah, all the time. I, I you know, we uh, we make things and we we prototype things and you know, like. Uh, it's kind of absurd to use the term prototype for a visual object that's not 
a functional object, but we do prototype things that are prim their primarily pr their primary purposes purposes visuality is visual. So, we, and did you say vibing by the way? That's awesome. I said what? Vibing. Vibing. Yeah. Vibing. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I like I, I like fractals, and they're cool, and they're like you know, any any self organizing principle like that is always interesting because it's like uh um yeah and uh yeah i mean the 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 the, the practice the practice which i using because the practice is a i'm not a doctor <laughs> and uh but the, the 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 culture that i that artists make for themselves to make things or to, to you know produce what it is that they do it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's speculative, and it's, and it's, and it's riddled in, in doubt, but a kind of soft doubt, not a doubt about working with objects that are going to change the world, or like, you know, what I mean, it's, instead of that intensity, I think interesting artists generally uh, just kind of play, you know, and they, and they. They, they make interesting aesthetic and visual problems and they really inquire into like the 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 holes and the and the assumptions of like an aesthetic tradition and the aesthetic tradition is, is a tradition of like what happens when 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 some how do you describe what something feels like when you're looking at it I mean what's the, what's the definition of an aesthetic it's like a a, uh, a perceived, uh, uh, I forget, it's, it's, it's actually really good, but it's a, it's a, um, the feeling of, of perception, you know? So there's a lot in something as stupid as that to go, to make an entire life out of, <laughs> you know? If you're somebody who's trained to look, and artists are basically professional lookers at the world, you know, we, we look at the stupidest things. And we think about what are the what are the potential, what can we show people about the things that you think are happening as you look, and 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 that's what makes images, and then that's what drives the differences in them. But um, we're not in theater. We don't write, even though some artists do. But you know, and we make objects, we make things, we make places, and we make you know. So um, you asked about theatricality. I love theatricality, you know. I'm not a. I'm sort of the opposite of. Uh, like I don't agree with uh, with what's his name, uh, the the guy uh, who hated minimalism. Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. The. Um, I don't think that uh, if theatricality if, and absorption. Yeah, yeah. theatricality is uh, Michael Fried. Michael Fried who basically he he attacked minimalist art by saying that it was too theatrical. And that, uh, and the and the reason that the, that theatricality was a problem for an artwork is because it it works that are too theatrical rub up against becoming potential props, and props on the order of objects is a diminutive in relationship to a, an art an artwork or an art an artwork and like a piece. So I don't think those differences matter so much because we're all putting on a show. And it's all fiction anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you all for coming. And remember that Folly is still open. And please, please um, stop by and see it again in this new type of light, evening light. Thank you. Thank you all.